Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 213, Fear. Uh, this is our first in our comma series, so nine vlogs are to follow fear. But we're starting here because fear undergirds the rest of this series. And indeed, fear undergirds academic life. It is what I've described as the subsidence in academic life. Fear means for PhD students, your career stays in neutral. You never get beyond the PhD program. For early career researchers, their career is filled with so much promise. And then the fear emerges and their career simply stops. For our mid-career researchers, the wonderful scholars that are juggling multiple balls most of the time, they are the backbone of international higher education, the mid-career researchers, they feel the fear and their career simply stalls. And for senior scholars, when the fear emerges, their career just simply fades away and everybody waits for them to retire. So fear is a constant companion in academic life. But what we're going to do today is we're going to look at fear as a comma, a pause in your life, not a full stop, not an ending. You feel the fear, comma, and do something. And so today we're going to focus on the fear as a comma, not a full stop. So in the vlog today, we're going to talk about fear. We're going to look at fear. We're then going to look at the specificity of the fear that emerges in academic life. But then, of course, as always, because I am such a buoyant old goth, we're going to finish with strategies to manage the fear, how to address this and transcend it, treat it like a comma. So let's start with fear. Fear emerges from a perceived danger or a perceived threat. And the word perceived is really important here. Fear doesn't have to be real. And in fact, most fears are not real but the perceptions make it real and the perception of fear has an incredible outcome it can be attitudinal it can be behavioral it can also be psychological and these are profound changes in our life the most common response to fear that's cited in the literature is flee freeze or fight flee freeze or fight and we're witnessing all these divergent responses to fear right at the moment. But the important corrective that I have to stress right at the start is flee, freeze or fight emerges in response to a perceived threat. So even if the fear is not real, and most are not, there are psychological, attitudinal and behavioural responses to it. Now, instead of valuing and validating these perceived fears, they're argued that because they're not real, they're less important for that individual in that context. And I think too often in the literature, there is a split between rational and irrational fears. So the irrational fears are often described as phobias. So they've got a whole other word that gets them away from fear. And I, to be frank, do not believe that the split is that clear or that clean. And also the notion of, oh, that's an imagined fear or a phobia, that's not addressing the contextual matters that have occurred in the last 20 years. So the real changes to families, to workplaces, to leisure, to relationships, to money, to the environment. We're not addressing the real problems that certainly may create imagined fears, but they're not irrational. They're rational responses to a particularly irrational context. So dreadful behaviours and dreadful events are a constant of our life. They're not irrational fears. So today, right at the start, I wanted to validate the supposedly irrational or imagined fears, the, if you will, what if fears. Because we can't understand a fear if we demean it as irrational, if we go, oh, look, there's these real fears and over there, they're sort of phobias. Not the case. So what makes fear so damaging to us is that it aligns with anxiety. So a fear can be managed, 
but fear when hot wired into anxiety transforms fear into that uncontrollable dread you know the apocalypse is coming so part of what we have to do and what we're trying to do today is isolate the fear so keep the fear address the fear look at the fear look at it look at the fear and stop it cascading into anxiety or denial or jealousy or anger or worry so we have to sit in fear and of course that makes us incredibly uncomfortable we don't like to sit in fear and there are really good and rational reasons why we don't like doing this because fear produces real physical responses in us so it's that old flight or fight thing right so we hyperventilate our heart rate increases we blush we sweat we have profound sleep problems right so as you can see socially and culturally fear is a disruptor and it has consequences for our age profound consequences for our age because families are unstable relationships are unstable jobs are unstable the economy is unstable research is unstable teaching is you've guessed it unstable aren't we doing well and through this fear we never settle we're never relaxed we never feel that calm after the storm and there is a reason for that because higher education internationally is the storm not come after the storm, we're in the storm. We work in the storm. Endless restructures, endless budget cuts, expectations not tethered to reality, and a profoundly unstable academic and administrative workforce. And of course, the realization, and it is a true one, that if you don't want this job, there are all about 20,000 incredibly well qualified people on this planet today that do want that job. So if you don't want it, that's cool. No one is bothered because there's thousands of people that are well qualified and want the job. So the truth of that is none of us are special. None of us. None of us are one of a kind. All of us are replaceable. All of us. Now that is a profoundly uncomfortable truth because we're taught from when we're a little tiny child, you're special. Actually, none of us are special. Every single one of us is replaceable. Now, how do you feel in response to that realization, which is of course true. Now, you may feel fear in response to that truth and I acknowledge that fear and I acknowledge that fear as important and completely normal. It's a normal reading of a pretty terrible reality so feel the fear absolutely but if it is disordering your response to the threat then that is when we have to intervene if that fear is blocking you making decisions and enacting behaviors that will stop you in many ways surviving this system then we have to do an intervention here. So if you continue to sit in the fear, then anxiety, worry, denial, anger, rage will start to emerge. And you simply won't make it in academic life. And I'm sorry to be as harsh as this, but we are living and working in an incredibly ruthless system right now. And if you count yourself out by simply living in the fear and not making decisions, so if you marginalize yourself, no one's gonna help you. They're gonna love that because it's a competitive environment. If you've marginalized yourself, you won't get a second glance. People will go for the price. So therefore I need you, yes, to feel the fear and do it anyway. I need you to do that. But more importantly, I need you to acknowledge the fear understand the fear, learn from the fear, and make a decision to take one step beyond the fear. 
And I want to talk through now, as we move to the specificity of academic fear, our second stop of the day, I want to talk about the two most common fears that exist from university academics. There are specific fears that exist in universities, and there are two. And the challenge is, <laughs> we socialise these fears uh, into our PhD students. So our PhD students learn from us epistemology, ontology, methodology, absolutely, but we also socialise them into our fears. And these two fears are actually quite distinct in the university sector. And I think there are reasons for that. I think this context our history is linked so much with the clergy, with the military, with the political elite of different nations. And this means that we've sort of still got a bit of that medieval institution in us. And the university has had to manage a wash of changes. You know, the Industrial Revolution, democratisation, Fordism, post-Fordism, underemployment, resource depletion, overpopulation, quantitative easing, climate change and anti-intellectualism that often results, of course, in a fear of smart people. Right. So the first fear that we experience in academic life is, one, a fear of change. And that's because academic life historically has been based on a slower clock than the rest of the workplace and the world. Semesters, terms, annual grant cycles, grade book entries once a semester, and of course publishing, having to manage with some disrespect the the commentary from reader two on our article. Oh, we'll get to that, but you know, they were just wrong and how do I manage someone that's just wrong? And of course the nature of tenure and permanent posts meant that most of the academic workforce through most of history was pretty stable. So progression was predictable. But neoliberalism, and I am using this term accurately rather than just a sort of a, a slammed label as it's being used at the moment, oh neoliberalism. I'm actually using neoliberalism accurately today. And what neoliberalism did to the university sector is it deregulated it and that allowed market forces to be active in a public good. So when that occurs, very odd variables emerge. And of course, at the same time as that was occurring, there was a massification of international higher education. So more people came, became part of the university than at any point in its history. So as you can see, logical, rational, calm processes of appointment and promotion left the building like Elvis. Gone. It's gone. And this has meant that the socialization of the predictability of academic life has also gone. We are living on fumes now. And of course, cycle upon cycle upon cycle of restructures, precariat employment, zero hour contracts, let alone bullying, nastiness, jealousy, means there's very little left of what Newman described as the idea of the university. So academics fear change, full stop. And that's why whenever anybody's talking about supervision, when I'm talking with a 60-something-year-old man about supervision, he invariably goes back, nostalgia, goes back to his supervisor in 1978. So what all of this means is we are desperate for stability. But it is an impossible stability. It's nostalgia for a stability that never really existed or maybe only existed for very few. So the fear of change is based on an imagining of a university that never actually existed. And the fear of change is made even worse because academics are not actually happy in this current system. So I don't think I've ever spoken to an academic when I've said to them, how you going mate, how you going, you all right? And I've never had, oh, look, brill, mate, brill, going well, yeah, good, yeah, good, fine, yeah, really positive, going, going well, mate, how are you going? I've never had that response. Instead, whenever I say, how are you going, it's met with miserable. This university's gone to dogs. 
let me tell you what my head of department has done now. Or, of course, my personal favourite, students these days. They just don't read. When I was at university, I read students these days. So as you can see, what we've got is a fear of change that's mashed in to a profound unhappiness in the current system. So this means, logically, academics don't want to change a system in which they are unhappy. And there, dear friends, is the nature of the higher education sector right now. And therefore, there is a second fear, and if this fear could be overcome, it actually would solve the first fear. And obviously the solution is, if you are unhappy in your current university job, the obvious solution is leave that university job and find a job that you will enjoy. Right? Now, of course, this was Karl Marx's double freedom. Okay, We as workers only have our labour power to sell. We can sell our labour power. That's the first freedom. But never forget the second freedom. We sell our labour power, but the second freedom is that we can sell that labour power to anyone. So if you, as a PhD student, or you as an academic, if you're unhappy, then go and sell your labour power to someone else. And of course that's where, because that's logical, oh, well, I'll do that then. But so what's going wrong? Well, that's where the second academic fear becomes debilitating. So academics fear that if they do make those changes, then they won't have the skill, the knowledge or ability to manage the new environment. So this is where you hear stuff about imposter syndrome, fear of failure, fear of being found out. All that stuff bubbles to the surface. So the result of these two academic fears is that academics sit in mediocrity, in bullying, in denial, in academic jealousy, in resentment, resentment's a big one, rather than make the changes that might actually make them feel a bit happier about their lives. So is this you? You are really unhappy in your present life, but you're not prepared to make the changes and make the decisions to make yourself happier. So these two fears manifest quite differently, I think, in PhD students. But the greatest salve of these two fears is one thing, preparedness, prepare yourself. But we are conditioned through our family, through our friends, through our workmates, through our supervisors to fear. And of course the problem is all these people who are important to us in our lives, they loan us their fears. <laughs> so we then have to deal with the impact of the displacement of other people's fear as well. So a great example I can give you, this always makes me laugh. So my PhD student, uh, supervisor, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, when I got the job in New Zealand, so I got my first full-time academic job in New Zealand at the Victoria University in Aotearoa, New Zealand, wonderful job. Uh, when I got that job, he said to me, PhD supervisor, don't go to New Zealand, you'll never make it back to Australia. You'll never make it back to Australia. So imagine saying that, I got a job, don't go. Now actually, it was a great experience. It was a one-year contract, I did it. I returned to Australia immediately to a job and I've never been one day out of work since that time. So I, yes, as a very, very young woman, felt the fear and did it anyway. Okay. But also it was because at the time I knew that my supervisor was inexperienced, selfish, foolish, self-absorbed and he didn't read enough and he was frightened that at some point he was going to be found out. So he told me that I shouldn't go to New Zealand so that I would remain a tutor in his first year course, so do all the work in the curriculum, keep the teaching evaluations reasonably high, because he was a truly dreadful lecturer. So he tried to displace his fear of being found out onto me. And so that fear was completely about his needs. 
So he failed. He certainly attempted to try and get his own back. He never read my work. He decided he wasn't going to sign off the PhD when I finished it pretty quickly in New Zealand. So he thought, oh, that's revenge. This is going well, isn't it? So be aware that fears are an STD, a supervisory transmitted disease. And if your supervisor has fears, then you will catch them unless you are pretty careful. Now I see this time and time again. This is my lived reality. A supervisor who is brittle, self-absorbed, a narcissist, angry, clearly frightened that his or her best days are behind them, and using students as the grenades to do their dirty work. And of course, the students' careers are destroyed in the process. Fear of the unknown is actually part of a triple threat fear, worry, and anxiety. And of course, there are two ugly stepsisters that invariably attend these three, and that is apprehension and dread. What a combination. So together, these sensations create anticipatory failure. So instead of anticipatory failure, so at least having a risk, risking failure, academics in particular go, oh no, I'm not gonna do that. So they resort to laziness, jealousy and of course procrastination because it's best to do nothing abuse other people scroll through twitter then confront not a fear but confront a moment of decision making anticipatory failure is actually the failure and a fear of not making a decision because if we make a decision the outcome may not be what we would like. And that's cool, because you've made a decision, you're not quite where you want it to be, so you make another decision. Rather than sitting in the anticipation of failure that's never actually going to emerge if we simply make a decision. I'll give you one more example of the power of decision-making, even in the midst of despair, okay? Now I've worked in a lot of academic jobs, like a lot, pretty high. And I think I'm now at what, nine, I've worked in nine universities in four countries, all right? So I've moved around a lot, I'll move around a lot more yet, right? And look, in that career, there was a really, really tough patch in the first couple of years of the 2010s, right? This was a tough time for the world, reeling in the consequences of the global financial crisis. It was a tough time for universities, regulatory regimes were changing, the baby boomers were retiring, and so the lack of succession planning for my generation, Generation X, our profound mistreatment over decades, suddenly started to appear, right? So in that environment, I took a job. I moved universities, but I also moved countries. And I took a job working for a dean that was an uncontrolled narcissist. She actively wanted to destroy people. And so academics suicided, academics retired overnight. So mates of mine that were across the corridor work one day, how you going mate? That night they went, I can't manage this anymore. They retired and they never came back. Uh, we, a whole series of people, relinquished tenure. So just, I'm stable, I've got a permanent job. <laughs> Permanence ain't worth this. So a stack of people left. And of course, a huge turnover of staff. Now, I moved countries to take up this job. And I was living, while all of this was going on, in a single room with a shared toilet. <laughs> all my stuff, all my worldly possessions were in storage. I was sitting in this room. <laughs> wow. And I knew that I'd made the worst decision in my life. I'd made an enormous error. And I'd done all the investigations, all the checks, everything seemed okay. I, mean, I know I teach the stuff, I know what I'm doing. I'd done all the checks and I'd made a bonkers of a decision. And of course the problem was both Steve and I, a husband and wife, were working at this institution. So our entire financial future was in the hands of this woman. Now, I could have panicked. I could have got stuck in the fear, 
freaked out, got sucked into the psychodrama happening around me. By the way, stuff had a lot of alcohol problems as well. So when I was dealing with people, they were pretty sozzled halfway through. If people are drinking by mid-morning, you know you're in an interesting environment. So I could have sat in that endless fear. But I did a few things. I did a few things. And I made a series of decisions. So firstly, I called an error an error. I made a mistake. I made a mistake, so I called the mistake. No one else, no one else is to blame. I made a mistake, so I called it. Right, stuff up. Then I made a series of decisions to focus on what was required to get me out of that mistake. And I knew there was going to be no hero no parachute, no easy way out, that I would single-handedly have to claim responsibility for my mistake and get us out of it. So there were two key decisions that I took that stopped fear from paralyzing me. Firstly, I acknowledged my mistake. And secondly, I acknowledged that action would have to be taken to get me out of this. So with the fear gone and a plan developed, insight emerged. So this problem, this mistake had been caused, and I do this a lot, was caused by me trusting in the integrity and the decency of an academic, in this case a dean. So I trusted that dean. And, in fact, she was interested in destroying people's lives. So I made a decision, the gift of insight after you make decisions, is I went, okay, so this problem has been caused by academic management and my trust. So I'm now going to enter academic management myself and stop this happening to anybody else. And I knew that I would have to start at the bottom as an academic manager, at the lowest of the lowest universities, because I'm a woman and therefore it's assumed I am incompetent. So absolutely start at the bottom and show that I can do this. So I accepted a middle management job at a low university to demonstrate that you can show decency and integrity and respect and care and still be a good academic manager. And my career today was not only based on that mistake but the decisions and the insights that I gained from it. So I've told you that story because I know there are people out there, hi, that today, right now, you are feeling trapped in fear. You are frightened. You are confused. You are filled with worry. But yes, there are solutions. But for PhD students in particular, and yes, academics more generally, our two specific fears, so remember, fear of change, but also fear that we don't have the skills, the ability, ability and the knowledge to manage a new environment if we got into it, those two fears present very specific resolutions for us, differently from the rest of the literature. So I wanted to note particularly how these fears manifest on a sizable minority of our PhD students. I know some of you are watching this today. There's a group of PhD students that just don't want to finish their PhD. Sometimes this is a conscious will, sometimes it's completely subconscious. They, they just don't want to finish the PhD. And they throw every possible excuse into the mix to not finish that PhD, right? And obviously the coronavirus is summoning that group with a whole series of excuses now. But of course, whatever happened, they would use that as an excuse because they're too frightened to finish. They're frightened of change. And then of course, they're frightened that they don't possess the skills, the knowledges and the ability to manage the new environment post the PhD. So they cling to the PhD candidature not realising, and this is the, you know, the disaster that occurs, not realising that the length of the candidature and the dating of your references actually blocks you from the career that you could be taking if you just finished up and took the risk, felt the fear and did it anyway. 
So this fear of finishing the PhD is a fear of change and a fear that you don't have the skill set you need. So the point of this series, the comma series of vlogs, is to present this comma state, fear, and explain why it exists in universities, it's rational and logical, and why it exists for PhD students, but then find strategies out of it. So the final few minutes of this vlog is the optimistic, buoyant component where I say, okay, you're in the situation, you've acknowledged it, what can we do now to make fear into a comma so you can get on with the rest of your professional life? So the options I'm going to present are going to make you uncomfortable. You may really not like to hear what I'm going to say here, but my job is to help you feel the fear, do it anyway, but make decisions. And here are the five strategies to enable you to do that. Let's do it. One, give yourself professional development targets. Through the PhD, the students that don't only do their PhD but have a regime, a intellectual fitness regime, if you will, of doing professional development, they do very well in managing their fear. And there are reasons for that. Our time summons particular cliches about agility and resilience. I'm never convinced terribly by those two words. But the point is those students that do their PhD and have professional development targets know more. They just know more. And they're able to present that knowledge on their CV. That means they can place their PhD in context and transcend their single research project. So that means they have the ability to translate their skill set for employers. As I say to students all the time, the only reason that somebody is going to employ you is if you can solve their problems. So if there was no problem to solve, then no one would ever get a job because you'd save the money. If you didn't have a problem to solve, then you'd simply hold on to the dough. But if you've got a problem to solve, you have to hire somebody to solve that problem. So you have to be able to solve those problems. But if you're sitting in your research area, and in a PhD, that's very small, hoping that a postdoc will magically emerge in a damaged university sector, then you are dreaming. Enact professional development so that you can translate your impressive skill set beyond your PhD. A PhD is great, it's great, but a professional development program is the train that moves your PhD to the next stop. Two, don't assume that you are right. Listen more, talk less. One of the great challenges in being a PhD student is that you see a very blinkered rendering of a university. So as a PhD student, you see a very, very thin slice of the university cake. So you're not actually seeing enough of a university to make a generalizable point. You have one data point, your PhD. So as we all know, you can't make an interpretation or a commentary on the basis of one data point. Similarly, your supervisors have worked in a university environment that was much more banal, much more benevolent than the university sector in which you will be employed. So listen and learn to listen during your PhD. Arch beyond your experience, arch beyond the experience of your supervisors. You need lots of data points to work out where your career could be heading. So listen to those stories of success and yes, of failure, and you will learn more from the stories of failure. Keep learning, do not shut yourself off from life's decisions. So just because you disagree with somebody or you don't like them, doesn't mean that you can't learn from them. So don't sit in self-satisfaction. I'm tremendous, I'm fantastic, I know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. You're doing a PhD, you have a data set of one. So you've got to challenge yourself to listen and perhaps hear the really unpopular knowledge 
that colleagues are sharing with you. Have a sense of what is happening and indeed what could happen. Learn from others, important. Three, the biggie I would argue, learn to make decisions. Making decisions is probably the greatest life skill there is. But all of our culture is about blocking that knowledge. So if you make decisions, you have power. Therefore, the people in power don't want you to know that you can make decisions. They want you to sit in fear, in denial, in jealousy, in anger at your fellow students, ignorant of the options that are available to you. Therefore, start right at the beginning of your PhD to make decisions. And these decisions may be small. Tutor in a course, become a lab demonstrator, mark an online topic with a quirky, weird bit of assessment. So make these small decisions. So feel the fear, know that you don't know what's coming, but be cool with that. Get used to the process. Feel the fear, make a decision. Feel the fear, make a decision. And that means by the time some big decisions have to be made about your life and teaching and research and families and all the rest of it, you've got used to it. All right, feel the fear, take a breath, make a decision. Cool. Knowing that whatever happens after you make that decision, you'll be cool. You can manage it. You're okay. You can manage it. So start to relanguage your life. When you feel the fear, when you feel that twist in your stomach, force yourself to say out loud, so you're feeling it. Force yourself to speak the words, I am making a decision. Present tense, I am making a decision. Don't sit in the, in the fear, say the words, make a decision, do it. Four, read widely and learn about the university system. Oh yeah, fear emerges through the unknown. So if you, in your academic life so far, you've only known two universities, say you did your undergraduate degree in one university, or, and you did your PhD or your postgraduate work at another university, right? Or the group, I would argue, that's most paralysed by fear, they enrolled in first year and went right through to a PhD in the same university. Okay, quite common in Australia, can I say. So that means they've had their entire professional educational experience in one institution. So there's no sense at all about how universities as a workforce, how they operate. And again, you're generalising from a data set of one. It also manifests in scholars who spend a period of their career, or most of their career, in one specific area of the sector. So that might be, for example, in regional universities, it might be in universities of technology, or it might be in the top end of town. So people have spent their career at the Ivy League, the Russell Group, the Group of Eight, right? So if you have lived your entire professional experience at the top end of town, in the Group of Eight, say, then you're used to, as an example, plenty of money philanthropy, funding agencies look benevolently at your project because you've got a good research environment. Remember how much of research grants are about explain your research environment. I'm at a Russell Group University. Tick, thanks for playing, that's a good research environment. And of course, industry partnerships. So there's plenty of money. And then of course, those staff and students move away from that university with plenty of money. Very common, for example, that if someone is at the top end of town to get a personal promotion, they often have to come down in the sector, and of course all, I disagree with this tearing, but anyway, come down in the sector to gain the promotion, right? So to personally get themselves promoted, they've got to move down the league table of universities, right? You can see what's happening here. Explains a lot about academic management, actually. But you see that these staff members or students move to the rest of the sector and they've got no experience in how the rest of the sector actually operates. And they're horrified. They're shocked. And of course, they are quite rightly frightened because they don't have the skill set that they've used in the past to be able to manage that at this university that may be, say, a regional university in a country town, right? So it's always easy, I think, to throw money at the problem. So you might have a gaping wound somewhere, but if you put a, a posh frock over it, then you've masked the problem. And again, often when you throw money at the problem, the problem does sort of disappear. 
but when money is not the answer, what solutions are actually available to you? So as a PhD student, it's really important to understand the entirety of the university sector, understand the local specificities, the different national systems, how international ideas move around. So it's a beautiful, delicate system, international higher education, and there's something really beautiful about understanding its local undulations, grasping its diversity, grasping its complexity. And recognise that the experiences that you have had in your PhD may have absolutely no relevance, none, in understanding the university in which you will work. Five. Don't ask, don't ask, why me? Now, this was amazing in the literature that I was reading for you for the vlog this week. The, the key problem, the key phrase that allowed people to stay trapped in fear was when they asked the question, why me? And they just stayed there. They stayed in why me and they never got out of it. So all the strategies that we've talked about today are lost, are pointless, if you are living in the why me questions. Because you're teetering at the edge of change. Change is happening to you. You haven't created change. Change has happened to you. Life has thrust its change upon you and you're denying it. You're sitting in self-pity and you're sitting in fear rather than swallowing hard and going, right, this has happened. Okay, so summoning your resources, summoning your skills and making a decision to allow you to step out of that fear. Now, we all know PhD students and colleagues who use why me a lot. So my research design isn't working, why me? No one's doing my survey, why me? My systematic review is not very systematic, <laughs> why me? My supervisor is leaving the university, why is this happening to me? My friend has finished her PhD. I haven't finished my PhD and I'm brighter than she is. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> so why me is a life stopping question because it's not allowing life and decisions and movement and change to happen to you. It's also allowing you, quite problematically, to sit in denial because you're blaming everybody else. You're blaming the university, you're blaming your supervisor, you're blaming your mother, you're blaming your partner, rather than feeling the fear, taking a breath and making a decision and getting on with it. Now, in the literature, the why me question is huge. Whole books have been written about it, and it was fascinating for me because this question allows people indefinitely to live in fear. Wow. And I was so surprised by this, and I don't know if it's useful to you, but I've actually never asked that question. So I was sort of reading this literature going, wow, this is really a thing, and I didn't know it was a thing because I've never asked the why me question, ever. And I would argue if you can simply remove that question from your life, when you feel yourself asking it, stop yourself, relanguage yourself, and your life will improve almost immediately because you're seeing life clearly rather than through the lens of fear or indeed disappointment. Now, I've never asked why me, even though some truly weird, bonkers, truly dreadful stuff has happened to me. So, great, great example I'll always use that I went straight to when I was reading the literature on this is when my beloved late husband, Steve Redhead, got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So, he was going to die in weeks or months. He was going to die. So, got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Thanks for playing. And indeed, when Steve actually died, I never asked why me. Never. And when I was reading the literature this week, I thought, oh, wow, I wonder why I didn't. And that's because I called it something different. I called it what it was. So Steve getting pancreatic cancer was a tragedy. It was dreadful. It was a horror movie. But it happened to me because of decisions I had made. So I made a decision to marry a man who was 17 years older than me. So there was never going to be a happy ending, right? You see that, you've made a decision, that's the consequence of it. 
and it happened to me because I loved him completely. We gave everything to each other. And most importantly, I think, it happened to me because I knew at the time, the moment I knew, it was my responsibility to make sure this dreadful situation was managed properly for him. So it was my responsibility to create the ending that he wanted. So it happened to me because I needed to confirm and demonstrate that love and that respect and that decency right till the end. Because Steve's death and Steve's illness was not about me. It was about him. But what was about me is delivering on his choices. Now significantly, Steve quite amazingly never asked why me either. He was at the height of his intellectual powers, one of the brightest men in the world, and he was dying. And not once did he ask why me? because he argued it was real, it was an unex unexplainable tragedy, but it was real. And fearing death doesn't make it any less real. Managing reality, no matter how horrific, requires decisions. Now team, there's absolutely nothing special, wondrous, or actually terribly interesting about me at all. I'm just some bird that sort of wandered around international higher education and made a living. That's who I am, and I'm cool with that. I try and do the best I can every single day by making decisions. But I've never asked why me. I know why it's me. It's me because I can manage it. It's me because I can make decisions. It's me because I can do it. It's me because I can survive. If you ask why me, you are allowing yourself to live in fear. And there is a lot to fear in contemporary international higher education. There's a lot to fear. But the only way through fear is to feel it, to name it, and make a decision. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.